Hello, I'm Gary Pinnell, and this is your Bible study for today, and we'll be in Hebrews chapter 6. You can see behind me the anchor, and that is in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. Uh, I didn't actually paint that one, uh, but... It says, so you can see what's written on it and be backwards to most people. But it says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. All right. Both sure and steadfast and which enters the presence behind the veil. Okay. So if you're able to see that, the... Uh, we have uh, the anchor of our soul. That's Jesus, okay? And that's Hebrews uh, 6.19. Again, I didn't do that painting. One of our, my granddaughters did that. All right, Judy, it's good to see that you're on. And uh, the Lord bless you, sister. Okay, we're getting close to the end of the school year here and appreciate your prayers as we finish up today and tomorrow and um, also we were able to go last night to a baccalaureate service with the Gideons and gave out a hundred New Testaments and uh, so I know that they're giving them out other places and that's just an opportunity to get the gospel out in these last days that we're living in. And so let's go ahead now <clears throat> into chapter 6. And there it says, therefore, now remember we have to, uh, remember when it says therefore, we have to see why it's therefore. Because earlier in chapter 5, we're reading about, and you have come to need milk and not solid food, remember? Uh, there uh, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness for he is a babe now babies uh, need milk don't they and even as they're into two years old or so uh, they still need quite a bit of milk but as they go along you want to see them uh, eating solid food. So when a person is first saved, yes, they they into, in fact, uh, Paul through the Holy Spirit here will address that again in the first part of this chapter. And that is that we need to not only know about the gospel, <laughs> And that's wonderful to get saved and so on. But once you are saved, you need to grow in the Lord. And we would think it's, it was strange if a baby always wanted milk and they would not be very strong after a while if they were only drinking milk. So we as Christians, if we're only drinking milk, uh, the word, in other words, just uh, about salvation all the time. Let's say that a pastor every Sunday that's what he talks about, is uh, only salvation. Now, I think it's good, uh, even as Billy Graham said, that he tried to get the gospel in <clears throat> about the cross and, and Jesus' resurrection, at least someplace in his messages, every time. Now, that's not wrong, but what is talked about, what if you had messages only on salvation every Sunday, uh, well, that would be like you're wondering or not thinking that the people are truly born again because once they are saved, they need to go on into all of the Word of God. Now, remember, we talked earlier about First Thessalonians is uh, written in the uh, earliest part of the church, even before the Gospels were written. And there, of course... Um, he was talking about 
the uh, Paul talked very clearly about the rapture of the church. That's First Thessalonians chapter four, verses sixteen through eighteen. He talked about the man of sin, so that would be after the church is taken out, the seven years of tribulation that's coming on the earth, and it's called Jacob's trouble, and uh, at the midpoint, how that there will. Uh, the Jewish nation will turn to Christ as their Messiah, realizing that this other one is an imposter, and so on. So he had taught that. He taught that right from the beginning. So often, as we said today, people, oh, well, we've been going for several years now. I think maybe we should go into the book of Revelation. Uh, well, some people never do get into the book of Revelation, and I will tell you that they don't know the book of Revelation because they'll say, they'll call it Revelations. It's not Revelation. There's only one revelation of Jesus Christ, and that's the book of Revelation. It's not Revelations, all right? And so it tells you something right away. There's many Christians today. Oh, I don't know what's going to happen. I think it's just going to pan out, they say. Oh, I believe in the pan theory. Everything is just going to pan out. Well, that's wrong. That's not what the Word of God teaches. And so they are babes in the Word. They're just taking the milk of the Word only, but they don't take the meat of the Word of God. Now, we're going to be talking about some uh, meat in this book. All right, so uh, hang on to your hats here as we go. The uh, So therefore that we're saying, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, he says, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection completion, perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So if you're preaching every Sunday uh, only salvation messages, that's not of God. We're to go on and to teach the rest of the word of God. So what did he consider the foundational things. So we know salvation, Christ died, was buried, and you're turning from your sins to Christ to save you. But also, verse 2, he says, of doctrine, of the doctrine of baptisms. You notice that's plural, baptisms. It's not just water baptism we talk about. We talk about the um, being baptized into the body of Christ. There's only one true church, the body of Christ. And then we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So there are three baptisms. Okay, that's why it's plural here. And uh, in the Ephesians, where it talks about uh, there's only one baptism, it's not saying... Uh, that there's not three baptisms like here, or else there would be a contradiction. No, it's saying that there's only one baptism where we're all baptized into the body of Christ. So there's only one church. There's only one Father. There's only one Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what they're saying there in Ephesians. But uh, here, it's talking about uh, these are be beginning things. These are basic things. After a, how do you get you get saved and then you get baptized in water, which is not salvation, by the way. There are people who think, oh, the Church of Christ, they taught um, that, well, that's how you get saved is by water baptism. No, that's not it. Uh, we're saved by the blood of Christ and through faith in him alone. And for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. No, uh, when you're baptized, uh, what it is, people can't see the inside of you. They can't see your faith. But when you get baptized, they can see that. 
and it's a testimony to the world what has happened on the inside of you. All right, so doctrine of baptism. So that was taught by Paul in the early churches. They would teach that and the other apostles. And so then um, of other things, of laying on of hands. Well, uh, there would be when you're ordaining someone to be uh, a bishop of the church or an elder of the church, pastor of the church, uh, of laying on of hands. That's where you put your hands on them and then you pray uh, God's special blessing as they're a leader in the church. Also, uh, the basic things of resurrection of the dead. Today, there's many, many Christians that do not realize that when the rapture takes place, that's the resurrection. That is part of the first resurrection. They don't even know that, okay? And then it says, and, there, and there's even some people that claim to be Christians and they don't even believe in the rapture of the church or the snatching away of the church. They're called amillennialists. It just keeps going the way it is and and uh, that is, there's no rapture of the church as far as they're concerned. Well, that is wrong and they're not even versed in the basic things of the word of God and of eternal judgment. Okay, the great white throne judgment and eternal hell. All right, they're not even familiar with that. They don't even understand about that. And uh, so those are the beginning things. And so we're supposed to teach that at the beginning. But as we go along in the word, then we need to know what else it says. And this we will do if God permits. So you're going to say, the, teach these basic things, pastor, teacher. But then you go on, okay, four, verse th four, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have been tasted the heavenly gift and have been become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Now, here we get into a discussion that has oh, broken a church right down the middle. Talk about the universal church. Um, all those that are truly born again. Uh, this is a really controversial subject, all right? And it is one that probably we won't solve just by uh, discussing it here at this time because people have this so uh, well ingrained in them, being in different churches as we're brought up in them, that it's very difficult even to talk about this area. But we're going to talk about it because I don't think there's anything in the Word of God that we shouldn't talk about. Uh, if it's in the Word of God, we need to discuss it. And we need to come to some conclusions, some decisions. does not mean that maybe as you go along that you will change some of your opinions on what this actually means. But I think we need to understand that in the church, there are groups that are considered, considered Arminians. Arminius taught that a person could lose their salvation. And then you have those that follow John Calvin, and Calvin taught that you could not lose your salvation. It was just both of these men, it was very cut and dried. <laughs> and, and I personally, I don't think it's all that uh, cut and dried. In other words, 
uh, black and white. I think there's something here that we need to study into further because if you just stopped right there, then um, you would uh, maybe come to the conclusion that definitely there's uh, people are losing their salvation all the time and then uh, uh, they can't be saved or they lose their salvation and they can uh, get their salvation back again. Well, that is... Uh, uh, this is where the discussions come in. And then, um, but it says, um, verse 9, and then we need to look at that one also. It says, But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation though we speak in this manner. Okay, so we're going to go back up and look at the whole passage together in context. Uh, verse 7, For the earth which drinks in the rain and often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God, but it bears thorns and briars. It is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Now, beloved, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. Okay, so let's talk about this. And uh, please don't let this, uh, you know, get in the way of our friendship or, oh, I'm not going to listen to him again because of he's saying this. Well, first of all, let's clarify some things. In the Old Testament, there is nowhere where it gives assurance of salvation and it does not say that we're sealed in the Old Testament. It doesn't say that. And in fact, I think it's very clear that uh, people... Uh, that could have been considered believers like King Saul. Uh, it said they even had a change of heart. He even uh, prophesied. And they said, is he one of the prophets? But then he went and he uh, killed the priests of the priests of God. He, uh, many of them, their whole families, men, women, and children of the priests, he went to the witch of Endor, uh, even after he had chased out uh, other witches and so on. He went to the witch of Endor and uh, even uh, got, uh, went to her. And of course, that was wrong. And um, he chased David and tried to kill him, uh, a righteous man. Uh, he even tried to kill his own son, uh, a murderous type person. Um, that uh, it says in scripture, there's no murderers in heaven. And there's no place that he ever repented of his sin. You have Balaam in the Old Testament. Uh, he, even though prophecies were given through him by God that are in the book of Numbers, they're true. They came true. Talks about uh, out of Judah would come a scepter and talks about the scepter would be uh, the king uh, and a star would come out of him and so on. And he gave those wonderful prophecies how that God would bless his people and so on. He couldn't curse them. But then later what he did, he went and uh, talked to the king because he wanted the money. His heart was into money. And he told the king, but I couldn't curse him that way, but I've got something for you. And uh, I'm not giving the exact words, but paraphrasing. And then this is what we find out as we study the scripture there. That he uh, told him, here's the way you can curse the Israelites by sending your the Moabite women, does he remember, uh, your beautiful women, and uh, they will take like idols with them and say, 
Well, you could have a relationship with me, but you have to bow down to this idol first and burn incense to it or worship that, and then, of course, I'll be yours. Well, uh, it was, it did, in fact, Israel and thousands were deceived by that. And uh, one even went and took a, a spear and threw it through two that had come into the camp like that and killed both the Israelite and the uh, Moabite and so on. So there uh, we see that uh, there is uh, Balaam is one in the Old Testament. We believe that if he were ever a believer, it's questionable there, but if he was, he had lost what he had uh, and he died in the battle t that ensued. You have um, others uh, that were relatives of David, an advisor, and went with uh, um, his son in the rebellion, and um, David's son. And so you have on a, a quite a few in the Old Testament like that, that it's pretty clear that they're uh, not... Uh, you know, still, they were not, if they were at one time believers, they're not. Now, then you have Jesus, who talks about uh, the different seeds, the, uh, that, uh, the different types of plants and so on, uh, that come up from seeds that uh, he gives the word there. And uh, so we have um, that type of thing. Now, a dog just came in the room here, so he may be barking and that sort of thing. We'll have to figure out what we're going to do about that. Uh, <clears throat> so, anyway, we have those in the Old Testament like that. Uh, then you have the New Testament uh, that we need to look at, and that is... Um, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, and uh, we are uh, given a great assurance of salvation. We can know that we're saved because it talks about in uh, uh, first, uh, first John chapter 5, verse 13, these things have been written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay? and other verses uh, like that. And even here it says that, uh, um, Beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak uh, in this manner. And then you come to practical issues, like uh, there was a person, evangelist that worked and was speaking and leading many to the Lord uh, at the same time that Billy Graham was. And then he wrote a book, So Long, God, uh, something that to that effect. But he turned against the Lord. Uh, you have others in our times, the pastors and so on, that uh, have uh, turned against the Lord. And uh, so you can see that this is not just a, a cut and dried issue. I think that it's, then there are people come and ask me on occasion, well, I, I think I've lost my, uh, I, I've lost my faith. I'm not saved any longer. And then they take the, the verse in, uh, that talks about Jesus spoke of how that uh, there is a sin against the Holy Spirit and that won't be forgiven you. Well, uh, some people believe there is definitely a sin against the Holy Spirit, and that is rejecting the Lord and his salvation up to the point of death, all right? Only, uh, but there are those that they think they have committed the unpardonable sin, and they really haven't because they will say, I, I'm worried that, that I maybe committed the unpardonable. If you are convicted of sin, you haven't committed the unpardonable sin. Why would God convict you? He's the Holy Spirit's the one that convicts. Why would he convict you if you uh, can't do anything about it? 
No, those people that have committed the unpardonable sin, they, they're, they're so hardened, they would not even um, be concerned about their eternal destiny. Uh, they, there are people that have hardened their souls so much that they will not even listen to salvation any longer, and they turn their back on the Lord. And so uh, maybe like these Jewish people, uh, some of the Jewish people in the church, they were, uh, they saw what it was like to be born again. They started for the Lord, and and they even believed in Him. Maybe they were baptized, but they turned their back on the Lord, and they go back to Judaism, and that is, I believe, what Paul is, the Holy Spirit is talking about here, and that, but that beloved verse 9 we are confident better things of better things concerning you yes things that accompany salvation so even the uh, parable of the sore jesus pointed out there's people i believe that can have emotional uh, decisions that they make and they there are people that seem like they're Christians, and they pretend like they're Christians and others, and so on. Uh, it's just difficult to tell. Only God knows their heart. We're not going to judge. God knows, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have sown, shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So they had been, uh, those that are truly saved, they were uh, living for the Lord. They were showing their salvation, as uh, Paul tes, says, and as James says, that show me your faith uh, by your um, uh and I was going to share about what we talked about in Romans. And uh, Paul uh, there is talking about those that had uh, shown their faith. They have faith in Christ. And James says uh, that when you are truly saved, you, you have faith, you will show your works that they manifest that you are truly born again. Now, you're not saved by the works, but your works will show that you're saved. And then he gave the example of Rahab the harlot that accepted the spies and so on as Abraham. He was saved by faith, all right? So we demonstrate our faith by our works, and not that works save us, but that we're demonstrated. Verse 11, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of the hope until the end. So right up to the time that we go home to be with the Lord, we want to live for the Lord, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Later on, he's going to uh, in chapter 11, the, um, we will see those that have um, the, uh, the, the, we think of that as the hall of fame for those of faith in chapter 11, but we'll get there. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. So God, uh, when he was making a covenant with Abraham, he put Abraham to sleep and he walked through the animals that had been cut in the sacrifice in half and he walked through and that's how they confirmed a covenant. And he did it when Abraham was asleep. So God's made the promise by himself <clears throat> saying, surely, Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Uh, Abraham died and went on to be in heaven with the Lord. Uh, 
you have uh, Moses, and um, uh, he uh, rejected that of being uh, Pharaoh of Egypt, which he was in line to be, uh, because he sought a better uh, reward, heaven with the Lord. For men uh, indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Okay, so they uh, are going to make a covenant and uh, make sure that it is sealed, signed, and sealed and delivered, we say. Okay, and uh, so they would go by the law. And thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. So God gives us he gives us this promise, okay? And uh, so that is uh, what we see here. And we're going to re- talk more about that in just a bit. That's God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, which we as born-again Christians, we're uh, heirs, of, we're joint heirs with Christ, Everything that is coming to Christ is coming to us as far as uh, we're going to rule and reign with him. More abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability. That means that it it can't change. It's like the law of the Medes and Persians. It's a law that God doesn't change. Once Jesus says it, it uh, will happen. The immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Uh, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. We have fled from uh, or fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. So uh, Jesus and his word, uh, those uh, are immutable, okay? In other words, they can't change. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence uh, behind the veil. So uh, when Jesus rose from the dead, he went and poured uh, some, uh, put some of his blood on the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant that is in heaven and possibly even the Ark here that is on the earth, but for sure in heaven. And that's where the anchor, and of course they were very familiar with anchors in those days and boats and we are today too. But then the anchor has to be in a sure place so the boat doesn't drift away. And he's going to talk about drifting and so on. Uh, as an example, as we go on further in uh, Hebrews, but where the forerunner, that's Jesus, has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Here, this name Melchizedek comes up again, and we're going to go into more detail next time because our uh, time is up, but uh, that uh, the the king uh, of righteousness, the king of Salem, which is Jerusalem, uh, where Abraham gave a tithe to him, and uh, the king of righteousness, and uh, uh, Abraham served the Most High God, and so did this this man is a picture uh, Paul is going to give of the Most High God. And so he's a picture of Jesus Christ because he doesn't have a beginning, doesn't have a genealogy. Now, whether or not it is truly Jesus Christ or uh, just an illustration of him, we will talk about more uh, as we go along here. But today, let's uh, look to the Lord in a word of prayer. And... um, 
thank the Lord for his word. Father, we just thank you that we have an anchor in you, a hope that is not just, oh, it's a possibility to know, but that we can know that we're saved, even as First uh, John chapter 5 and following says that these things are written unto you, your word is written unto you, that we may know that we have eternal life. So we thank you for this assurance of salvation that you give us in your word. And we just pray now that you'll bless those that have heard and they'll share it with others. And we pray too, Father, that you will help us uh, to get your gospel out into all the world. We pray for those in uh, Jerusalem and Israel and we pray for the peace of Israel. We pray for those who are suffering for you around the world today that you'll be with them in a special way. We love you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name, with thanksgiving. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you, folks, brothers and sisters in Christ, and we'll see you, God willing, tomorrow.